All right, so I think we will get started. Thank you all for joining us for this month's Leading with Artivism. Uh, I'm Lilia Perez. I'm the Grants and Programs Manager for Arts Mid Hudson, and I'll be introducing everybody and getting us started. Uh, to start, welcome, of course, and thank you for being here on this beautiful night. Uh, this event is being recorded and will be available for viewing next week on Arts Mid Hudson's YouTube channel. Closed captions are available. You'll see them at the bottom of your screen. To activate, click on the closed caption or CC button at the bottom of your screen and then press show subtitle. You can submit your questions via the chat. Click the chat button at the bottom of your screen and the chat will open. You can also submit questions if you're watching on Facebook um, and we'll ask those as well. And please note the views and opinions expressed are those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of Arts Mid-Hudson. We are so lucky to be joined this week for Leading with Artivism with uh, uh, Gerardo Castro. Leading with Artivism is a live monthly interview series created and curated by Poet Gold in collaboration with Arts Mid-Hudson, featuring a diverse mix of artivists, artists activists who have taken up the charge through their art to highlight social issues. We invite you to ask questions and to get an inside look at the hearts and minds of these courageous creatives. Poet Gold is a rare talent who grabs you by the heart and says recognize. Poet, author, performer, songwriter, community artivist, and speaker, Bettina Poet Gold Wilkerson is pushing the boundaries of poetry and spoken word. Living with a chronic illness since childhood, Poet Gold, or as she is affectionately known as Gold, brings a soul-searching insight about the human existence, love, dreams, challenges, and triumph. Gerardo Castro was born in Ponce, Puerto Rico. He grew up in the New York metropolitan area. He obtained his MFA from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York in 1997. His work has been exhibited in museums and galleries nationally and internationally, including China, Puerto Rico, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Budapest, Latin America, and major United States cities. In his work, he uses art forms such as drawing, painting, collage, printmaking, reading, sewing, and fire. His art activism began in 1987 in New York City as a member of ACT UP, the International Direct Action Advocacy Group that works to impact the lives of people with AIDS. It was in this context that he decided to come out as gay. Four major events brought this activism to the forefront. First, the high number of deaths from AIDS at the peak of the epidemic from 1987 to 1996. The Vatican releasing a statement condemning homosexuality. Third, the death of his brother, Wilfredo, from AIDS in 1993. And fourth, the lack of inclusion of Black and Latino artists in his university art history courses shaped his personal, social, psychological, and artistic practice. Castro has his studio in Newburgh, New York, where he currently lives with his partner, Michael Gabor. In 2008, he and Michael opened Newburgh Art Supply, and in 2010, Gerardo founded Newburgh Open Studio Tours, which is now in its 11th year. Um, and so uh, we are just so lucky to have both of them with us tonight, and we're actually going to start by looking at a virtual gallery presentation of Gerardo's work and ask him to kind of uh, lead us through it and talk a little bit about the work there. So let's take a look at that. On our website uh, at artsmidhudson.org, that's where you can find um, any Leading with Artivism um, uh, virtual galleries by going under Programs, Leading with Artivism. And then here you can find um, some information about Gerardo and Gold and the program. And at the bottom, this is where we have the virtual gallery. So if you want to come back and take a look at this on your own time, you can do so here. So hi, Gerardo. Welcome. Hello. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm so excited for this. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this. Thank you for, for being a part of this and for sharing your work with us in the virtual gallery. Um, I'm going to start uh, at the this corner of the room and, and just ask you to talk a little bit about some of these pieces and I'll, I'll cycle through them as you speak. All right. So this particular one, I think this is probably one of my first pieces that I ever did as a quote unquote professional artist. This was done in 1988. It's called um, Death in the Sick Room. Um, in 1988, I, I participated in the first World AIDS Day, which is December 1st, 1988. And this was one of the pieces that I created for that. Mm. 
And then we have uh, these two pieces here, which I know you use burn as one of your um, fire and burning as one of your mediums. And, right. and both of these pieces have that, right? So the one that has the, the star at the top, mm -hmm. that is a piece that I created in 2018. And it is called Puerto Rico Governmental Termites. Um, it's a burn piece. It's one of the pieces that I did addressing the issue of colonialism on the island of Puerto Rico. Um, what many people don't know is that Puerto Rico was literally um, and continues to be a colony of the United States of America. And being that we are a colony, the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico continues to be one of, um, it's a tumultuous relationship. Um, what I decided to do here was address the concepts of how the government is literally eating people up in terms of um, a lot of the um, e economical abuses, um, environmental abuses. So the holes and the tears in this Puerto Rican flag, if you can call it that, um, symbolize the damage done by termites. Um, I call them governmental termites. Termites are one of the most feared pests. And when they start eating at something, they devastate what they eat at. So it's symbolism and metaphor. The other piece is, um, it's called warning shots. That I created in 2017 after Trump becomes president. Um, what you see there is, again, the idea of the American flag, which is a national symbol representing both political and cultural values. And I transform this iconic object um, and remove it from its beauty and turn it more into a um, burnt up flag. Um, when I remember when I started hearing this idea of him being president, um, I, I just knew that there were many issues that we were going to have to deal with artistically, politically, spiritually. And um, I was invited to attend, participate in a show at Vassar. And this was one of the pieces that they asked me to put in. Um, so what's interesting about this is that whenever I hear of the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, I don't get patriotic. I actually think of um, the bombing of other countries, how we bomb so many countries, um, people that are on their way to run errands, people that are sitting in churches. And that's basically the symbolism behind that. This is another burn piece, right? Right. Um, that piece is burned in 2015. It's called Haiti and Dominican Republic, One Island, Two Worlds. Um, a very controversial piece. Controversial because it depends on which side of the argument you're on. And then what I mean by this is this. Um, there is, in the middle of this image, there's a, a, a number, 169-14. And the number is over the island of Hispaniola, which is half the Dominican Republic and half of Haiti. 169-14 um, references the naturalization law that was passed in 2013, which is a horrific law that stripped the nationality from individuals born in the Dominican Republic to undocumented immigrants who are predominantly black and of Haitian origin. In other words, basically in a nutshell, a law that said that if you were not born in the Dominican Republic and you are of Haitian uh, parents, you have to return back to Haiti. Um, what's crazy about it, that the, the law applied retro retroactively to 1929, which meant that there were people who would have to return to Haiti who had never lived there. Um, international human rights groups strongly condemned the decision as racist and xenophobic and argued that it would render hundreds of thousands of people stateless. What's also interesting about this is that in the middle of that island, there's a word called perejil. Perejil is a Spanish term that means parsley. 
And in 1937, there was something called the Parsley Massacre, um, which um, happened during the Trujillo dictatorship. Um, basically what it was that in 1937, many Haitians were killed because of just being black, of being Haitian. Um, the reason why they call it the Parsley Massacre is because in Spanish, to pronounce the R's is pretty easy. When we say perejil, you can tell that I'm Spanish. But when the Haitians, because of the French, could not pronounce the R, they were then massacred. That's how they differentiated whether you were Haitian or Dominican. Um, this is very controversial within the Latin community. Um, it is not taught in a lot of Dominican schools. Some of my Dominican friends say that part of it is made up. The Haitians say there's proof that 10,000 people were massacred because of the Parsley massacre. Um, this piece um, was for that. Um, pretty powerful. Piece. Yeah, very powerful. This piece, Gerardo. So now we're um, getting into some of your painting. Yes, so that piece, let me see if I, I'm trying to make sure I remember the, the. This one, and so people know too, you can get some more information about the piece by clicking on the information button in the right corner. So this piece is called Migration of the Spirit. Right, um, basically this piece is um, influenced by the idea of someone having to um, move or transition into a new country and a new society. Um, it's a piece about loss, it's a piece about borders, separation. Um, it's a piece about spirituality, of crossing the rivers of the things we do for our children when we have to migrate. Um, mm. I did that, I think it was 2011. Yes, that's And that said. hand beaded, I, I also bead a lot. So the center panel, mm. it's all hand beaded and fabrics and Beautiful. And I think I'll, I'll spin around here because I think you're going to talk quite a bit about this series with gold. Um, but could you tell us a little bit about some of these pieces over here on the far wall? All right, so I'll start with the two men and then the four women will be part of the, the last. Mm. Um, this is part of a series that I've worked on on the concept of machismo. Um, this is called Flor en Florecita. Um, basically, it, it, it's a criticism of the machismo culture. Um, for decades, the dominant cultural image of masculinity has included being heterosexual, physical, strong, having many children, walking, talking, dressing like a real man, crying or showing any emotions, any kind of passivity or softness is always considered a negative thing. Machismo is very dangerous in the Latino culture. Um, there's a belief that men need to be hyper-masculine, domineering and controlling, and without the slightest hint of femininity. So what I did here was that I basically took these two very buff-looking men, one wearing a Cuban flag Speedo and a Puerto Rican Speedo, and I put them in rollers and put some makeup on them and kind of gave them a more feminine look. Um, what's crazy about this whole idea of, of um, machismo is that the machismo culture, the concept of machismo, you're never man enough. There's always something that could be picked on because of your whatever. You wore pink, men don't wear pink. Um, you move your hands too much. Men don't move their hands like that. Don't ever put a hand around another man because that symbolizes that you're weak or that there's something going on. So I take all of that stuff and I, and I play with it. So. And then I'll, I'll zoom out so we can see some of the other pieces and I'll, I'll kind of I'll cycle through them as you speak about this series that we've been working so on. So what we have there are um, part of a series that I've been working on now for about two years, two and a half years. And it's called Women of Water and Spirit. Um, it honors Latino women who have resisted traditional expectations of what women can and should do. 
it basically comes down to the idea of this divine feminine, which represents a connection to the part of our consciousness responsible for nurturing intuition and empathy, regardless of your gender. Honoring the sacred feminine in the spiritual sense means valuing the feminine principle along with the masculine principle, that we're both masculine and feminine. And they're equally fundamental when we reach into what is called the divineness within us, that we can't say, well, the feminine is better than the masculine. They both exist simultaneously within us. Um, so these women, uh, I think I'm up to number 12 now in terms of the series, but that woman right there with the sunflowers around her is Mariele Franco. I don't know if many people know who Mariele Franco was, but she was a um, Brazilian councilwoman um, from Rio de Janeiro, and she was assassinated in 2018. Um, she was a political activist, and unfortunately, um, she was assassinated. Um, her and her driver were assassinated. Four of, of um, the shots hit her in the head, killing her immediately. What was interesting is Franco, Mariele Franco was killed by bullets that were purchased by the federal police in 2006. So it was the government who had her assassinated. Um, and that's what that painting is about. Mm -hmm. um, there's symbolism. I, I use a lot of patterns and symbolism in my work. Um, the sunflowers were part of her political campaign wherever she went. She had sunflowers. Purple is a national or international symbol of feminism. Um, what I really love about this painting is how she's standing. Because although she was assassinated, she's defiant. Mariele Franco is now bigger than ever because of the assassination. And because of a Black queer, poor woman ran for office. After her assassination, more women of color in Brazil ran for office, which to me is very powerful. Just the idea is amazing to me. Yeah. So see which one is the next one. This one is Our Lady <clears throat> of the Unloved Woman. A Lady of the Unloved Women. Woman. Um, this is a painting that I did referencing femicide. Um, at the very top of the painting, there are arms, hands. Um, there's a black angel and there's this woman who looks like she's either half dead or about to die. Um, in Christianity, the concept of laying of hands is both symbolic and formal method of invoking the Holy Spirit but I use the concept of the laying of hands as a way of saying force, brutality, and punishment. Um, femicide is profound global injustice that has continuously risen. Um, sadly, Latin America and the Caribbean has some of the worst gender violence indicators of any region in the world. Violence against women and transgender people has grown to such an alarming level in Puerto Rico alone that in January 2021, they declared a state of emergency because of the amount of women and trans women that were being murdered. Um, again, the concept of machismo, the violence that, that comes from it, that a man is in control and you do what a man does or I will get rid of you. Um, so that's what this painting is about. I think there are, yeah, there are two more. This one yeah. is- um... That's Sylvia de Villard. They were the Renard, uh, also from Puerto Rico, um, was a Afro-Puerto Rican um, dancer, choreographer, actress, and spokesperson for the Afro-Puerto Rican culture. Um, she lived and was born in Puerto Rico, came to the United States during the Black um, Freedom Era, the 1960s, early 70s, and returns to Puerto Rico with a new concept of the idea that Black and Puerto Rico are one, that our Blackness cannot be erased. What's so important about her is that she was so revolutionary in making people understand the Afro-Puerto Ricanness of who we are. And 
Interestingly enough, we could probably get into that discussion in a few minutes, but the concept of blackness, of Puerto Rican blackness has come back into the mainstream because of the movie In the Heights, where we are questioning, so this takes place in the Heights and where are the black and brown people? Um, she is one of those people that in the late 70s and to the 80s was questioning and making sure that we don't forget our Afro-Puerto Rican-ness. That's still mm -hmm. where they were. This one, Gerardo. Then that's, it's called Coronation of Santa Cacerola. I'll make this one brief, but this one is just to me funny and at the same time very serious. And it's basically um, referencing an event that occurred in Puerto Rico in July of 2019 where Puerto Ricans of all political ideologies, classes, and ages converged on a mass protest against the governor of Puerto Rico for the first time in the United States history, because Puerto Rico is part of the United States, um, a elected governor was forced to resign by mass protests. The governor of Puerto Rico had to resign because of these famous chats that leaked that were homophobic, they were um, commenting on the deaths that occurred during Hurricane Maria, and the people came out. What's interesting about Puerto Rico, and it also happens in Latin America, is that when we protest, we just don't hold signs and march down the street. We turn it into a production. We actually get pots and pans, and we beat the pots and pans. That's why she's holding a pot and pan. We beat the pot and pan, we sing, we dance, we turn it into a big fiesta where people are like, is this a party or a protest? Well, for us, it's a little bit of both. What's interesting is that the governor did resign and this painting is uh, referencing the day we all got together in Puerto Rico and beat our pots and pans to get the governor out. So, and now she's a saint, I made her up. So I made a new saint, Saint Casarola. <laughs> Gerardo, thank you so much for walking us through this. And again, uh, you can anyone watching can go and watch uh, walk through this at their own speed. And thank you so much. You jam packed so many different critical issues and so much information into. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of that. Oh, I'm going to pass it to Gold. And uh, thank Thanks, you so much, Gerardo. Welcome, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, so excited. Thank you so much. I, I was so enjoying um, the virtual gallery and, and the work you have because every piece has its own story, you know, critically, historically, uh, currently, contemporarily. It's, it's just really amazing. But I'm going to start here, um, going back to Our Lady of the Unloved Woman. Uh, we have someone who asks, what is the a piranha fish at her feet? What, what's the symbolism? You know, could you talk about your inspiration for that particular work, which you did a little bit, but particularly right. the fish the sea. So uh, again, that is part of that series of, of these women. Um, one of the things that they all have in common, and, and it's easier to see if you see them all together, is that they're all, they all have headdresses or crowns, some kind of royalty, some kind of power, um, but they're all standing or their feet are in water. All of them, all 12 of them, there is an element of water at the bottom of the painting. Um, again, the symbolism of water, it's about life. It's about being born, cleansing, washing away our sins. At the same time, water is also very destructive because a tsunami can destroy an entire island. Just completely wipe it off. Um, now, the, the, the fish thing. That's the only painting of that series in which the water has an element of danger. Mm. The only one in which the water has an element of danger. The only woman that is basically quote unquote beat down to the point that even as she tries to rest her feet and sit on top of this tombstone, there's still danger surrounding her. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I wouldn't say that there's an actual meaning for the fish. Okay. But the fish are, um, they're called angler fish. 
Mm. I don't know what people know about anglerfish, but their, their, their teeth are angled inwards. So when they bite you, you can't release right. yourself. Right. It's a very weird fish and they do glow. They have this weird little thing that they glow. That's how they attract their prey. So there's symbolism behind the idea that, that, that the violence towards these women are at times um, explained by men almost as if, well, they fell in love with me um, and this is what happened. You know, they love me. And some of these women, unfortunately, fall for that. Um, what actually inspired that painting was my experience growing up in an abusive home. My, my mother is a huge inspiration to me. Huge, strong, strong woman. Um, my mother left an abusive relationship, my father, in 1967. She packed six kids and landed in New York City, not speaking any English, and raised us because my father was very abusive. And what I mean by abusive was not verbally. My mother was close to losing her life. Wow. Um, I, I always think of that image and I think of her, she's still alive and she's seen the painting and we speak about this openly. So it's not like I'm revealing a new secret. My mother knows how we speak about this openly. Um, femicide is, it's an unbelievable thing, the idea that the machismo culture is sometimes seen as such a glorious thing to some people. Oh, I need a man that really tells me what to do. That's, that's how I know he loves me. It's like, no, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. Right. And so anyway, the fish, metaphorically, even as she tries to put her feet in water, which feels so good, right? Feet feel so good when they're in water, but she's still in danger. She's still in danger. She's yes. still in danger. You know, feet in water is a cleansing. Yes, yes. You know? But um, so let, let me ask you another question. Your, and this came in through someone, um, your art and your values, are they one thing? Are they separate? Or do you, for instance, have political and spiritual values that are your drivers and you use your art as the method to bring those out? Heavy, right? Hey. Yeah, I'd have to write a thesis on that one, huh? <laughs> I'm going to write that question now. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm too much of a thinker, so that's going to keep me thinking into the nighttime. Okay. Um, so... This is, what, this is how I see things, right? Um, is I remember the first time I ever stepped into a college classroom. I was the first person in my family to go to college. I was very scared. Believe it or not, I was very shy. I was very scared. I was shy. I was timid. And I sit in this art history course and I was so excited. And um, halfway through contemporary art class, I, it, 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 it hit me that I had not seen black or brown artists being shown on the screen. And we're talking in the early mid eighties. Okay. And I, 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 I said to myself, should, should I ask? Because this is a professor, you never question the professor, he knows everything. <clears throat> and the semester's ending and I finally get to the point where I said, you know, I'm gonna ask. And I said, you know, the semester is ending and I still don't see a lot of black or brown artists. And he said to me, well, if you know of any, let me know. <laughs> wow. That transformed my life because, you know, and we're talking at a time where we didn't have the internet, where I went back home and got on the thing. I right. went to the card catalog. Mm -hmm. I went to the library and I looked for books, which I couldn't find. I called Puerto Rico. I called my family in Puerto Rico. I said, I'm looking for Puerto Rican painters. Is there a book? And they're like, well, I don't know. I would have to ask. I would, um, to make a long story short, that sparked in me the idea that I knew that I, whatever I painted or created had to, to some extent, be a reflection of how I lived my life. That 
whenever I see a Castro hanging somewhere, there's going to be a black or brown skin or person in there and an issue that is relevant to our struggle. Right, right. That, you know, we have those moments in our lives where we have to say, this defined me. This was a changing point for me and how I relate to my work. Um, You often render uh, the human figure's life size. Can you talk about that decision? Um, Because your work is narrative. So can you speak to that? Well, I I like the idea that when someone confronts my work, that it almost feels as if you are entering its space. Hmm. Like as if these figures are with basically overpowering you. Um, The paintings of the women, um, they're six feet in height. So they're pretty big. I've always painted large. There are times where I've done small things and um, they do their job. But I, I, I think when I'm confronting certain issues, I want you and your body and its body mm-hmm. to basically um, merge in some way, mm-hmm. whether it's by size or, or just by the idea that this body is just bigger than you. When I stand in front of these paintings, I, I basically feel them looking over me. And I intentionally created that. Do you, do you feel in any way that some of these paintings honor your relationship with your mother? All, all the time. Hmm. I, I tell people, when people speak to me about the colors in my paintings, I always say, you know, I'm so thrilled that I grew up in a house where the bathroom was Pepto-Bismol pink. My mother turned our house into little Puerto Rico. Mm. Um, The kitchen was turquoise. My mother's house to this day, when I go there, and it's interesting because I didn't realize this until one of my mentors went to my mother's house with me. My mother's house looks like my paintings exploded all over the place. There's color, there's texture, there's things hanging around. My mother has butterflies that light up hanging on the refrigerator door. She has Christmas lights all year round. You can't tell her no. (laughs) She says, well, I'm not a sad person. I'm not going to live a sad life. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what the lights have to do with that, but go on, mother. (laughs) So my mentor came to the house one day for dinner, and he said to me, now I know where you get it from. And I said, (laughs) what do you mean? He goes, you're stealing all this from your mother. It's your mother's, your paintings. And I'm like, no, it isn't. I said, I don't have all that craziness. In my- yes, I do have all that craziness in my paintings. <laughs> <laughs> some, of your, um, some of your work is very provocative, particularly mm-hmm. the nude pieces. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm a great fan of your, your, some of the nude work uh, that you have. And I wonder what your influences were. I mean, you, you know, you have... Uh, I mean, for me, when I look at your work, it little, reminds me a little bit of the Greek gods, uh, where, you know, the sculpture, the anatomy is, is there, but it's there in grace. You know, it's there to celebrate the, the human form. I mean, da Vinci did it from an anatomical perspective and from a science perspective, the, but, but the Greeks took it to a, to a different place before Christianity moved in, and then it became, oh, yeah. you know, new, and you had, you know, David's, uh, Donatello's David, which was totally new, but then later on, the fig was put in place and so what what is your inspiration behind the new pieces that you have well one I, I I've always painted the human body I love the human form um I for many years I thought I would let it go because I was like oh I've painted the human body but it just keeps bringing me back um I I love the idea that Um, And again, I think it references back to the 1980s when as a young artist, I was surrounded by many people who were dying of AIDS. Mm. Many of my friends, I went to more funerals in a week than I could ever count. And for a young person, that's traumatizing. Um, I was 18 years old when when I started having friends just die. Mm -hmm. Um, I was raised Catholic. I'm not Catholic anymore. Um, although I do have a big figure back here. Everyone's always asking about that, but that's another story. Um, 
So the human body during the 1980s was something that you had to be scared of because you would never touch someone, you would never kiss someone, you would never sit next to that person. There was all these things that were terrifying to me. Um, and I knew that seeing my brother die completely changed how I saw the human form. I, I hugged my brother to the moment he passed away. I kissed my brother, I hugged him, I drank from, people were like, you, you shouldn't drink from that cup. I was like, you're not gonna tell me I can't drink from this cup. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, the human body has always been, again, a battleground, a battleground with the idea that, well, you can't show nudity, but yet when you look at a lot of commercials and television and series and stuff, it's, it's, not, even, it's not even like, well done it's like it's like you know at least jazz it up with some beads or something you know let me and my mother decorate them for you mm -hmm. so i love using the human body because it's a way of of also reclaiming again the moments that i sat in a class and they were like um well if you find anyone who's ever done black and brown please let me know right me right <laughs> yes yeah, so now i'm like um i, I have a whole I interested him because that professor, I, I saw him many, many years later. And I didn't bring that up because it was no longer necessary. But um, he looked at my work and he did tell me how, how proud he was of, maybe he was testing me, I, but you know, but I still wanted to see that those black and brown people in, those, in that class know. So. Right, but the right. body to me is my battleground. Mm -hmm. And you know what's interesting? I just wanted to say this because it's like it just hit me. And that is that one of the things that I've noticed that in, in contemporary art, that if you paint black or brown bodies, they are really controversial. Mm -hmm. Paint a black male nude, it 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 has brought me issues. People are because with it comes a history. Right. Right. With it comes a history that people just don't even want to touch. Right. Because it's not a Disney World type of body. It's not a, a, I'm showing you this man or this black woman, powerful, nude. And it's like, no, because you have to confront all the things that it brings with it. That's the beauty of art, how it just brings history when you don't even want it coming to the door. That, that's, that's true about that. I think, you know, circling around to something that you brought up earlier, the colorism of oh. the high school or, or, or the lack of, yes. uh, really just a artistically a, a big issue mm -hmm. that was placed on the table. You know, what was your, what, do you have any opinion of that or? Oh yeah, yeah. So, so this is how I see it, right? Um, the, I, I think that In the Heights was beautifully done. Mm -hmm. Great music, entertaining. Um, but it missed the mark on being able to do what we needed to do, which is this. When you look at the history of America, the people who built this country, including African-Americans, Latinos, Asians, mm -hmm. are excluded a lot of times from the history of the country, the base, its foundation. And I think if it continues that way, we will be erased from everything. Mm -hmm. um, Miranda had an opportunity to do something because he's powerful, yes. he's well known, mm -hmm. he has the backing. That he had the opportunity to do the black and brownness and say, we're here. And what's interesting, and I've had this talk with many people in Puerto Rico, is that Puerto Rico, because of it being a colony, the idea of our blackness was never really celebrated. Right. Because everyone thinks that Puerto Ricans are all Ricky Martin and Jennifer Lopez looking, which, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. But there's other people. Right. There's right. other colors. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I, I just think that he missed the mark on that. Um, he has apologized, but you know, 
We'll wait and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. I think it was a, um, a as they say, a teaching moment. Uh, yes, I've had them. Yes, we all have. We we've, we've all had those those. I've had them moments. You know, I've had um, them. I, I enjoyed it. You know, I, uh, initially for me, I I really got into it after the blackout. So I, I recommend everyone go see it. <laughs> <laughs> but after the blackout, the story really became enriched for me. Up until that point, I felt like I was watching some type of Disney film. And I grew up in Washington Heights, you know, born bred, grew up in Washington Heights, right on 179th Street. Wow. So I couldn't figure out, you know, am I going to connect to it as someone who grew up in Washington Heights or is this sort of like a Disney story? I was just a little confused in the beginning, but by the end of it, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it overall, you know, but I, but I did recognize the lack of colorism in it, you know, but it's, and, it's a and what's interesting, I, I, I'm, I'm going to misquote the, the line, but paraphrasing it, the grandmother, I think, had a line in which she said something about a napkin that she just wanted to be remembered. Mm -hmm. That to me is such a powerful thing because, interesting, because that's, that's what, what was missing. The remembering of the other black and browns. Right, right. That should have been present. Right. Um, and there was an attempt to tell that. And, and you know, I, he touched upon it somewhat, um, but the legacy, the legacy, yes. you know, was missing. And and looking at looking at your work, I feel as if you are telling a legacy in the body of your work, particularly in your woman pieces. Mm -hmm. You're telling the story, their history, who they were, how how they became who they were, and uh, and which I what I just think is pretty remarkable because I think one of the um, one of the questions spoke to the fact of, that all your pieces are very, very narrative. When did, when did art... I'm a storyteller. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's apparent, it's apparent. And I'm gonna to toss this last question in here and looking at the time. Um, when did you recognize for yourself, I'm an artist, I'm an artist? Well, I'll tell you the honest truth. I don't think I recognized it, my mother recognized it. Mm -hmm. here, here, here comes the queen again, <laughs> a mother. So um, at a very young age, and I would say probably like seven, I was always fascinated with drawing and doing little things in my room. I was a very quiet person. I loved my room. There was no such thing as go to your room because I was already there. Um, back then, and I think most people will recognize this. There used to be the Woolworth stores. Mm -hmm. And my mother, we were very poor. My mother worked two jobs, factories. And my mother went and bought me a pack of colored pencils. And she got some paper and brought it to me. And she says, this is for you because you love doing this. I didn't know I loved it that much. Mm -hmm. In other words, she was always watching. Mm -hmm. She was watching, she was listening, she was experiencing me loving what I do. Mm. Um, I didn't know I was an artist until me personally did not know. I think other people recognized it first because I was, I was somewhat, I wouldn't say embarrassed, but like when people say you're an artist, I was like, I am. Um, I, I, this is just what I do. Right. Um, of course, years later, as time went on and I started exhibiting more and stuff, um, I realized that I was an artist the moment I started questioning the whys. Mm. I knew I was an artist the moment that teacher said, well, if you find any. Because an artist is not just an image maker. There's so many other aspects that come in. Mm -hmm. um, one of them being that, that you, you are a historian. You look at history, you research, you look at history, you touch history, you, you speak to people, all those things filter into you and, and allow you to then create what it is that you do. Wonderful. Well, Gerardo, thank you so much. Thank you. For being on Leading with Artivism. I loved it. You loved it? Yeah, yes. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> I loved, we loved having you. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
And thank you, Lily and Melissa, Art Ms. Hudson. Thank you so thank much you. for being partners with this. Gold and Gerardo, thank you so much for an incredible conversation. And um, uh, I just want to let everyone know that the next Lean with Artivism will be July 29th. And you can find that information on our website. Make sure you're signed up for our emails. You're getting those notifications. And Gold, thank you again so much for bringing this program to our platform. We just, we, you know, are honored to have this every month and really look forward to continuing this. And Gerardo, thank you so much for sharing oh, all of your work with us tonight. Oh, thank Wonderful. You. And next month, we'll be having, I like to call it Saprina Sculpt, but Saprina Troche. Great. Thank you all. I hope you all have a lovely night and a great weekend. And thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.